In the late 1930s, Stalin orders a wholesale purge of his fellow party members and military leaders. Eight of his top generals are executed. He was afraid of them. He was afraid they would rise against him tomorrow. He hated them all. They were the heroes of the Civil War, who also knew that Stalin had been a zero during the Civil War, and they had no respect for him. What hit them came like an avalanche. Over the next two years, 30,000 officers are executed. Stalin's army and navy is now leaderless. He decapitated the Soviet military. Why? So that those middle cadres would rise up, become leaders. Why? Because in them he would have total loyalty. Adolf Hitler begins deploying four million troops to Stalin's western border. Soviet factories are churning out tanks and planes as fast as they can, but Stalin needs to buy time. In 1939, he signs a non-aggression pact with Germany. Hitler agrees not to invade Russia. But Stalin has one account left to settle. The only surviving leader of the Russian Revolution. Leon Trotsky is living in exile in Mexico City. He is writing books about the revolution and Stalin. Stalin sends an assassin. On August 21st, 1940, Trotsky is dead. June 22nd, 1941, Hitler ignores the non-aggression pact and launches a blitzkrieg on the Soviet Union. Three million German soldiers and their allies march east. The Red Army is caught completely off guard. Their losses are staggering. Most of the troops on the Western Front especially in Belarusia, today's Belarus, had not been put on alert. So we lost more than a thousand airplanes on day one. This destruction in 1941 has to be blamed on Stalin alone. He truly believed what Hitler said. And that was one of his most severe and most absurd political mistakes, for which our country and our people had to pay very dearly. Stalin should have known. He should have known the war started that day. There were so many reports from Germany, Japan, and other countries. At his dacha outside Moscow, Stalin is alone and not sure what to do next when a car arrives. Normally, no one would drive out to the dacha without an order. The people from the Politburo showed up unexpectedly. When they entered the room, Stalin sat in an armchair and was deeply shocked. He literally jerked and asked, why did you come? He thought they had come to arrest him. He realized, of course, at that time, that it was all his fault. He was to blame for what had happened so far. Within a few days, Germans advanced more than 60 miles into Russian territory. The Soviets offer no resistance. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers are taken prisoner. Stalin does not heed his general's warnings. Stalin was not a man with any military knowledge. General Zhukov had warned him, we have to concentrate our forces here and merely hold our position on the other fronts. But he did not listen. On the 3rd of July, a shaken Stalin addresses his people. He declares the war a patriotic war. For the first time, 
he does not play the role of father. He was totally insecure. That was one of Stalin's worst speeches ever. He stammered. And you could see how shocked he was, how terrified. And maybe he even lost his trust in victory. But Stalin touches the hearts and souls of Russians. He appeals to their patriotism and conjures up the great victory against Napoleon. The people got into the trenches and shouted, for the fatherland, for Stalin. His orders are clear. There will be no retreat. His troops engage in devastating, often pointless battles with hundreds of thousands of casualties and POWs. In the beginning, the Russians suffered heavy losses. As soldiers, we often watched huge waves of attackers just being gunned down. I would say for every German casualty, there were 10 on the Russian side. Their officers ran behind them, and when the troops did not advance, their own officers would shoot them from behind, wave after wave, and they were simply gunned down. The Russian soldiers are trapped, caught between German forces and their own desperate officers. An officer remembers one soldier's fate. He had been stripped of his epaulets and collar patches and was digging a hole. I did not understand what this meant. This man said, guys, I got lost. We're in the woods after all. I've been fighting and I will continue to fight. They told him, in the name of the presidency of the Supreme Soviet, you are a deserter. He had to stand facing the pit. And then I saw someone shoot him in the neck with a pistol. And I saw him falling backwards. It was horrifying to me. I absolutely could not understand why they did that. Because when the boy told his story, it was like a confession in church. It was evident that he was truly lost. Not a day passes without executions of so-called enemies of the people, alleged cowards, deserters, and traitors. Stalin davao takie rozporządzenia. All of this was done on Stalin's order. Nobody was allowed to discuss it or correct it. And thus the masses of Soviet officers and enlisted men were killed. As Russian losses mount, Hitler divides his army and launches a three-pronged attack on Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad. His central army marches towards Moscow, the center of Soviet power. During the advance, Stalin's son Yakov is captured. Stalin is furious that his son surrendered. An eyewitness describes Yakov's interrogation. The interrogation was already underway, and the major asked, Yakov Zhugazvili, what do you think about the progress we made during the past four weeks? Now we are going to march into Moscow. At that point, Stalin's son smiled and shook his head. You are never going to enter Moscow, he said. My father made sure all the houses are booby-trapped, and you will never enter the city. And the Major replied, we'll see about that. In November, German troops have Moscow in their gun sights. They are less than 20 miles from the center of the city. 
We believe that the mass of the Russian army had already been destroyed and that the advance on Moscow was basically a matter of marching speed and not of enemy resistance. Since there was no more enemy between us and Moscow, we were sure the war was over. Stalin has the city fortified and parts of the government evacuated. He has a secret subterranean bunker built in the countryside. An emergency seat of government in case Hitler's troops seize control of Moscow. A train is kept waiting at the station for Stalin's escape. But Stalin stays. Now, the man who'd ordered the ransacking of churches and sent thousands of priests to the Gulag uses the power of faith for his own purposes. The churches are opened again. With the future of the country at stake, Stalin sends fresh troops to the front. They march from Red Square directly into battle. Stalin will also listen to the advice of General Zhukov. Troops from the Asian front are sent to reinforce his lines, troops that are trained in winter warfare. Stalin now gets the break he needs. The full force of Russian winter stops the Germans in their tracks. The tide of the battle for Moscow has turned. The battle for Moscow has turned. Russian lines hold, and their troops now move on the offensive. Hitler will soon suffer his first major defeat. His forces are overextended, and his troops weakened by the bitter cold of winter. Within months, the Germans are forced to retreat. Moscow is saved. The Allies are now more confident in Stalin's leadership and Russian prospects. The United States and Britain ship enormous amounts of supplies, supplies that will make a decisive difference. But Stalin wants more from the Allies. He desperately wants a second front that will require Hitler to split his forces and fight on both his eastern and western borders. But the Allies are reluctant. For Stalin, victims didn't count. His own people didn't count, they were just statistics. Neither the Americans or the English want to lose more people than they had to. That's partly why they lingered with the Second Front. In the north, Leningrad has been surrounded by the Germans for months. Stalin could have evacuated the city, but he decides the people should stand and fight. He demands that every citizen take up arms, every soldier defend his family. Valor at any price. The siege would last 900 days. Hitler plans to starve Leningrad. For a while there was shooting and then there was silence. Why? The German shouted something inconceivable, which I hesitate to repeat here. They called, you are going to die one way or another. The city is going to die. Leningrad becomes a symbol for the suffering of the civilian population. Families are torn apart. Children must bury children. They said, my little brother, Yurik, had died and shouted, get the sled from home and pick him up. I didn't know how to tell my mother.
подошел грузовичок. A truck came loaded with dead bodies just like they used to transport lumber. They were not sewn into a cloth, but lay there the way they had been picked up from the street. They were dumped into a pit. For a long time, I stood there and watched. One of the volunteer helpers approached me and asked, Why are you standing here, girl? I am waiting, I replied, for the pit to fill up so we can put the boy on top. Otherwise, he will be crushed. Over a million people die in Leningrad from cold and starvation. But the hatred that Hitler stirs up will strengthen Stalin. We went to war for the fatherland and for Stalin. You may deny that today, or mention only the country, but the country was linked inseparably with the word Stalin. In the south, the German army is heading towards Stalingrad and the oil fields of the Caucasus. Stalin will defend the city that bears his name at all costs. Hitler desperately wants to conquer it. It is a battle of will and egos. But Stalin will put his ego aside and let his generals fight the war. Practically. In fact, the generals were now in control. He only confirmed their decisions. Only on occasion, when he meddled with their business, things would turn bad. This new strategy brings victory for the Russians. Stalingrad marks the turning point of the war. German Field Marshal Paulus is taken prisoner. The Germans offer Stalin's son, Yakov, as a trade. When Stalin heard the proposal to save Yakov from captivity and let Paulus go in return, he thought about it for a while and then decided he would not swap a general for one of our junior officers. Stalin rejects the exchange. He lets his son die in a German concentration camp. I am often asked whether I hate Stalin for not bartering my father for Field Marshal Paulus. Well, I certainly would have had a better life if my father had been alive. But I usually reply that Stalin had no choice. Stalin was, after all, the man of steel. And in a barbaric display, Stalin would parade German prisoners through the streets of Moscow. I went to the Red Square with a friend of mine whose husband was killed in the war, in the front. And we stood and saw these animals as we shot. And we saw wretched human beings. They weren't even red-haired, as we thought, you know, Fritz's. They were normal, wretched people going on and on and on. And, my, and I felt terrible, but I didn't want to say that to my friend because her husband was killed. And she turned to me and said, I feel no hatred. June 6, 1944, D-Day, the Normandy invasion. The Allies' second front is finally open. The days of Hitler's Reich are numbered, and the Allies will plan the post-war era. Yalta in the Crimea. 
At a conference hosted by Stalin, the Allies meet. Stalin demands control of conquered German territories in the east. The Western powers are tired of war. They have achieved their objectives, and so they concede. At Yalta, Stalin had a much more determined, not necessarily clear, but determined view of how the world was going to change after the war. And Stalin being that immovable object, what were they going to do? Invade him? He knew they wouldn't do that. And he knew he had all the cards. And the weakness of the West for him was always evident in its desire to compromise and its desire to be a good guy, to have friends. Stalin didn't need friends. Stalin needed enemies. April 1945, the March on Berlin. Stalin wants to reach the capital and make it into the history books as the man who conquered Hitler. It was important for him to reach Berlin before General Eisenhower, especially since there was no resistance in the approach from the Western Front. He let tens of thousands die in senseless attacks just to take Berlin in time. Hundreds of thousands of lives were sacrificed, although the war was really already won. And in a final act of vengeance, Stalin orders thousands of German civilians killed when they attempt to flee. Of course it was drummed into our heads by our propaganda. Whenever you meet a German, kill him. Berlin, May. 1945. Stalin reaches his goal. During a tour of the city, high-ranking Soviets visit Hitler's bunker and discover his body. Stalin insists on secrecy. Under no circumstances was Hitler's death to be publicized. That was Stalin's explicit order. For this reason, no photographers, no press, no film crews were present when the body was discovered. Absolutely nobody. It was to remain top secret. Hitler's Reich has fallen. For Russia, the human cost of victory is staggering. It is the highest casualty figure for any country in the history of war. 27 million men, women and children are dead. 1945. Russia is now a superpower. Stalin celebrates his European victory with a parade in Moscow. He now calls himself Generalissimus. When the war was finally over, when it had ended with victory, Stalin, of course, became a god, a hero. That was an unforgettable time. Stalin sees himself as the invincible general and conqueror of Hitler. He was hailed as the greatest strategist of all times and all peoples. Of course, he was nothing of the kind. In fact, Stalin was inept as a military strategist. He didn't understand strategy. He knew nothing about uh, advanced uh, military uh, maneuvering, and he just could never win a battle if his life depended on it. The people did not win the war thanks to Stalin, but in spite of Stalin. He wanted to liquidate anybody who knew about his miserable failures in the war during 41 and 42. But in Stalin's fictionalized film version, The Fall of Berlin, he is the hero. He wanted history to remember him as the great victor. Not as the frightened politician who was scared as hell of Hitler.
The propaganda film even includes Stalin's imaginary victory flight to Berlin. The film was created by Mikhail Shirelli, Stalin's favorite film director. Shirelli's daughter describes how scared her father was at the first screening. The film was running. My father was sitting at the back. Of course, everybody had their eyes glued to the screen, but my father was watching Stalin and observing his reactions. In the episode where Stalin emerges from the big plain and the whole of Berlin kneels down before him, my father saw that Stalin slowly raised his hand and wiped tears from his eyes. Only then could he breathe freely and said to himself, I'm saved. Stalin really did like the film. After the showing, he said to my father, clapped him on the shoulder and said, Bravo, lad, bravo. And then he said regretfully, if only I had done it and had really gone to Berlin. July, 1945. Stalin travels to Potsdam in Germany to meet with the Allies. He sits down with Churchill and Truman. When he arrived in Potsdam, the first question that Churchill and Truman asked was, did you find Hitler's body? And he replied, no. Maybe he believed as long as there were rumors that Hitler could still be alive somewhere, the anti-Hitler coalition would stick together. But the Allies are too suspicious of each other, and the coalition will soon crumble. The superpowers divide the world among themselves. Stalin is now at the zenith of his power. 